transliterated into English, which most of it is, the words we have in the Bible, we don't think very well. So tonight, I'm going to do my best to not slide into the English ones. And so you may want to read along just so you'll know what I'm saying, because it won't sound like what you're used to. But we're going, we're going to be talking about Mika mm -hmm. tonight, which you'll find as Micah, if you want it in English. But I'm going to try to make that the only time I say that tonight. It won't be because I'm used to the English too, but we've, I've been trying to work on that for a while, and I'm enjoying the uh, Tree of Life version of my preferred go-to oh, are you really? reading Bible. Are you really? Hmm. So that, I saw that reference from Bible Gateway. So that's where I do most of my reading now. Instead of the Although we do have a printed one. I gave one to Carolyn for Christmas year before last. I think I used there was it. a verse in Jonah chapter 3, and that was the only only one of two English translations I could find that translated it correctly. And that would be one of the letters we mess up. There are no J's in Hebrew. It's got a J, it's a Yah. It's a, yeah, right. like a Y. So it's Yah. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and we're not sure of that because we don't know the vowels. Right. So we're pretty much making it up. Uh, that's more likely close than Jonah. <laughs> All right. It's six after eight, we only go to five, so let's pray and jump in. Loving Father, we thank you for this time together tonight. Thank you for the men that braved the cold to come down here tonight. I pray that you warm us up physically, but more so warm our hearts. And while this is a passage that doesn't feel warm and fuzzy, it is a good look at why we need a Savior. And Lord, we do, because we cannot come anywhere close to the righteousness that you require to be with us. But you've clothed us in that righteousness through our Savior and our Lord Jesus Christ. And we pray in his name that every heart and mind will be open and hear what you have for each of us and that's not the same for any of us. Thank you. Praise you. We love you. We say all this in the name of Yeshua. HaMashiach. Amen. <coughs> Pete likes to do that too, and I love it when he does. But this week is chapter one of Mika. And that's the minor prophet that we're starting on for the next several weeks, actually a few months. But uh, Jim Rouse was supposed to be here tonight initially, but he likes to prepare a lot more than I do. I like to prepare a fair amount, but for me it's days rather than weeks. And he, his preparation was quite intense. So. I offered to switch with him. If I remember doing this today, I might not have done that. But you're stuck with me tonight. And tonight I'm going to be split the time between introducing Mikhail and covering chapter one. And there are really two reasons for that. First, Mikhail one, and I should be doing ah, I'm not saying, but that's tougher. Mikhail one is fairly short and it's rather depressing. And unfortunately, we don't know an awful lot about Mikhail, except that he was from a town called Malashit. And he was a contemporary, a contemporary of one of the toughest ones to say, which does sound pretty close to what we do, Isaiah. And Hosea. And Amos. And I may get turned into a disprequent. <laughs> Isaiah and Hosea are, were about halfway through their period of prophecy when Micah comes on the scene. And he over, 
lapse a little bit with a boost towards the end. So that's where he falls in the, the line of the prophets whose name we know, names we know. Uh, and he was actually prophesying for about 48 years. Now, the word prophecy, we think of almost entirely in the you know, this is telling us about some future events. And that can be part of it. But the, the true meaning of the word is speaking for God. And you'll see every prophet, every book in the, in the prophet, like prophets, this is the word of God through. And that's what I'm hoping the words tonight will be. But you will often see that phrase. And that's what we need to remember. The you know, prophecy is of a, you know, I'm going to win the lottery next week. That would be a nice prophecy to come true, but not likely. But it is a, this is a word from God. And it's a word you need to listen to. And uh, let's see. When he started, Chatham was the king of Judah. And he was considered a good king as was his father, Uzziah, and who was before him. But this was a time that many people in, and I'm not going to try we're going to stick with that because it's confusing otherwise. But the people in Samaria, Israel, and Judah were all worshiping idols, despite they having some good leadership. Most of the people were split between idol worship and worshiping the God of Israel. Uh, the, key, the kings that were leading at that time, like I said, uh, there were a couple of good ones, failed to destroy the idols that were being worshipped by the people. So they did not take action. And they didn't put an end to the pagan worship. Ahaz followed Yoham. And that was his father. He ruled about 16 years. And Ahaz acknowledged God, but that was about it. He was not a seeker of God like his father and his grandfather before him. And Ahaz worshipped idols along with giving lip service to God. And it was not pleasing to God. Uh, he was very much influenced by the culture of the time. Because that is what was going on there. He probably practiced the idolatrous sexual rituals that took place in the pagan temples around at that time. And as a result, God punished him by allowing the kingdom of Aram and King Pekah Israel to defeat his larger army, which between the two battles ranged somewhere between 120 and 250,000 men. So we think of you know, small armies, sometimes they were very large during this period of time. How they handled the uh, logistics of that is beyond me. But also, he had one of his sons murdered. And the more bad things that happened to him during his reign, the further he strayed from God. And ultimately, he's labeled as one of the most wicked kings of Judah. Now, Judah, Judah is two tribes that were considered the southern kingdom at this time. Ismael is the northern kingdom and the other ten tribes. And some of this gets a little confusing in the reading of this, so we'll try to cover that. Well, after Ahaz died, Hezekiah, which is way off of what's Hezekiah, actually I'm sorry, Hezekiah, be a little closer. That's a tough one too. Became king, and you've probably heard that name. He was considered one of the better kings. He was a righteous king, 
and he actually preserved Judah for a season by destroying the pagan idols that had corrupted Judah, and he rededicated the Temple of Sol Solomon to Adonai. Most of Micah's prophecy revolved around Jerusalem, the Yerushalayim, the fall and restoration of Judah and the destruction of Samaria. In this sense, we can assume that the words of God through Micah had some impact on at least the following king. And, and Hezekiah was close to the end of Micah's prophecy. That was towards the tail end. So he may have had a significant impact on Israel turning around during that time. Alrighty. And here's where I was going to talk to you about what I was doing, but I already did that up front. So we won't. So let's go ahead and read. Start, and we're just going to read through the whole thing and then we'll break it down afterwards. Starting with verse 1. The word of Adonai that came to Micah, Ta Horashit, in the days of Yotam, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah, visions he saw concerning Samaria and Jerusalem. Hear, O peoples, all of you. Attention, O land, and everything in it. Adonai Elohim will be witness against you, the Lord, from his holy temple. For behold, Adonai is coming forth out of his place. He will come down and trample on the high places of the land. The mountains will melt away under him. The valleys will split apart like wax before the fire like water being poured down a slope. All this is because of Yaakov's transgression and the sins of the house of Israel. Who is the transgression of Yaakov? Is it not Samaria? Who are the high places of Judah? Are they not Jerusalem? So I will make Samaria into a ruin in the countryside, planting places for a vineyard. I will hurl her stones into the valley and will lay bare her foundations. All her images will be smashed, all her prostitutes pay, burned with fire, and all of her idols I will make desolate. For from prostitutes pay she collected them, and to prostitutes pay they will return. Concerning this, let me lament and howl. Let me walk barefoot and naked. I will make a howl like jackals and a mourning like ostriches. I don't know how an ostrich mourns, but I was thinking about that, but couldn't really see what the connection was there. For her wounds are incurable, for it has come up to Judah. It has reached the gate of my people, even up to Jerusalem. Tell it not in Goth, weep not at all. At Beit Le. Afra, roll in the dust. Pass on, you who dwell in Safir, nakedness and shame. She who dwells in Za'anan will not come out. Wailing on Beit Ezel, it will, light, it will take from you its standing place. For she who dwells in Maroth has languished for something good. For calamity has come down from Adonai to Jerusalem's gate. Harness the chariot to the steed, O inhabitant of Lachish. It was the beginning of sin for the daughter of Zion, because in you were found the rebellions of Israel. Therefore, you will give parting gifts to Moresheth God, houses of Achzib as a deception to the kings of Israel. Yet I will bring the possessor to you, inhabitant of Moresheth. The glory of Israel will come as far as Abulah. Shave yourself bald. Yes, shear your hair like the children of your delight. Enlarge your bald spot like a vulture, for they went from you into exile. Alrighty. Not being able to use my dominant hand is a nuisance here. Alright. Let's look at Michal 1, verse by verse. 
I don't know I'm supposed to say chapter by chapter, but we only have one chapter, so. Verse 1 is pretty much covered by the introduction, but I do want to note a little, I mean, if you're not familiar with the geography or the history, Jerusalem, I'm going to use it that way so I don't further confuse you, is the capital of Judah, which is the southern kingdom. And Samaria, in this context, is the capital of Israel, which is the northern kingdom. But Samaria is also a region in Israel. So you'll hear it referred to as a region. In fact, when you hear the good East America, likely that region. So sort of think about Samaria as being New York, New York. It's the town and it's the region that it's in. And to add to that confusion, you, you know a little history, you've got the Sumerian kingdom. And that was from the city of Sumer, and that was much earlier. And they had a unique language and a pantheon of gods. So it took me a while to figure out the difference between Sumeria and Samaria. So that was, well, it took me a while. That was 40 years ago, but I wasn't paying that close attention. That was a very early civilization in Mesopotamia, which is now modern day Iraq. So if you see a U in it, that's not in the Holy Land. That's not what we're talking about. So on to verse 2. Hear, O peoples, all of you, attention, O land, and everything in it. Adonai Elohim will be witness against you, the Lord, from his holy temple. Hear. Now we heard about the word Shema. And this is the same root word as Shema. It's actually Shimu. And I can't tell you about the conjugation of that, because I don't remember. But in this context, this is a lot more than, hey guys, listen up. This is a, it, it implies listening intently and attentively, understanding, and also implies acting upon the information you've received, and obedience. So here, in this context, is very powerful and is more than just listen up. All, as we are fond of saying here, means all. Uh, the Hebrew word there is kol. And it is more of a feeling of being a complete unit. It's everything as a, oh, what's the word I was looking for? It's sort of a homogenous whole. It's not lots of individuals that are all of you guys kind of thing. It's more of a all the congregation. So think of it as a, as a whole when you're looking at that word all as a rule. Now, the fun thing about Hebrew is, depending on the context, almost every word can have different meanings. So you can make stuff up, and guys have been doing it for years. That's why PD, and I totally agree with this, says, he believes in the inerrancy of the word in the original language. But when you have translations, some interesting things can sneak in. So the nice way to look at translations is these are different people's interpretations, because every translation is an interpretation. They're different people's interpretations of what this means in the original language. And these are guys that know what they're talking about. But if you get multiple translations when you're studying and look at all of them, you can see some of the nuances of the language that you won't see if you're just reading one. All right. Now, where'd I go? Yeah, the complete unit. And the next sentence is a different word that is more like the pay attention. When you see attention, that is... Focus your mind is the, kind of the implication there. Look at this and think about it. That actually sounds like a lighter word, but coming right after the listen, the Shema or Shemu, it is a stronger call to be paying attention. Anytime you have repetition in Hebrew, it's an emphasis. And this is, it started out very emphatic, and this is no less so. 
but that word by itself tends to be less insistent than the first one we looked at. And it's interesting that the land and everything in it is the object of this second listening word. So we don't really think of land as something that listens. But the word for land is evans, excuse me. I misspelled it, but I remember it correctly. And that can mean anything from dust, dirt. I mean, we were made from, I'm pretty sure that we were made from evidence. You know that for sure? I didn't check it, but I think that is the word when we are made from dust and to dust we return. It comes from the same word that is dust or dirt, but it all also can be countries and it can be the entire earth. And actually that's the most common use, is that it's all the earth is evidence. And uh, so we're, it's basically saying that this is going to have an effect, effect on the entire world. And that's almost certainly the intent of the use of the word at X there. Now the rest of that verse says that God, and here that the words used for God are very emphatic also. This is not a Abba Daddy. This is the Lord, Adonai, and then the use of the Tetragrammaton, which is the four letter, you know, when he was asked, who shall I say sent me, I am. And I try not to say it, although you'll hear it all the time around Christian churches, but you won't hear it in Jewish synagogues. But it's the yod Hey vav Hey, and it's the considered the Lord's proper name. And while you can write it down and among uh, Jews, just writing the word of God is very serious. Because first of all, you have to protect it. If you write the word down, you don't crumple the paper up and throw it in the trash can. It has a inherent worth that you have to protect. Verses 8 and 9 are going to take us to the lament and sorrow that Micah has watching what's happening in the northern kingdom and how it's become a plague on the southern kingdom as well. Now, his loyalties are with Yudak, the southern kingdom, but he laments both. So let's read 8 and 9. Concerning this, let me lament and howl. Let me walk barefoot and naked. I'll, I'll make a howl like jackals and a mourning like ostriches. For her wounds are incurable, for it has come up to Yudah. It has reached the gate of my people, even up to Jerusalem. Barefoot and naked sounds almost silly to us, but that's not the best translation. Barefoot is pretty accurate. That's not having your sandals. It's being without sandals. And that is a sign of lament. Uh, naked, as we think of it, is pretty much totally nude. That's not the case here. That's not having your top covered. And it is generally what we think of when we see guys that are torn their clothes and all they have is the loincloth, which is still pretty adequate coverage. But that is the, the vision here of what, of where he has gone with this lament. And it is a symbol of a very deep mourning. And if you've got nothing on but your loincloth, then you are embarrassed. It's like us being in our underwear, but that's how bad his sorrow is for what's happening. Because it's crushed by the destruction that is to come. And God has given him this word, so he's not a happy camper. The damage of the apostasy in Israel and Samaria is irreversible. And that's the way he describes it. You know, nothing can be done about that. And now it's about to topple Judah and Jerusalem as well. So 
He's sad to sit, away from home, but he's crushed seeing it coming to his home and taking over the holy place of God. And the Assyrians were at the gate of Jerusalem around 700 B.C. So this is a very real threat and you know, he, he does prophesy that Jerusalem will fall, but it doesn't happen in this moment. And I suspect he thought it was about to. But it does fall later. Now we have Hezekiah. Hezekiah is the king toward the end of his term as a prophet. And he is actually one of the best kings. And in the southern kingdom, in Yudah, they had a mix of good and bad kings. In Israel, in the northern kingdom, I, I'm pretty sure, I'll say 95% sure, there was not a good king ever. Not since the split of the kingdoms. You know what I mean? No, I can't. I don't know the king's well, so I can't <laughs> in an educated way address them. I'm crushed. I thought you were my <laughs> source for all. Lots of things I don't know. <laughs> so the Assyrians were knocking at the door, but they weren't coming in yet at that point. God had intervened and he stayed his hand against the people. Eventually that prophecy was fulfilled. And, but to me, Micaiah had to seem imminent. It was going to happen any moment now. On to verse 10, continuing with his lament. Tell it not in Goth, weep not at all, and bait the Afra roll in the dust. Okay, here Micah is reflecting on David's lament when Saul died. From 2 Samuel chapter 1. Verse 20. That lament took place at God. And Micah admonished them not to tell the Philistines, that's who killed uh, Saul, and that's who's still there to this day. And God was well there to this that their day, not ours. And that is he didn't want them to tell them that because they would be glad and rejoice. And Mikhan knew this because that was where he was brought up, they believed. So he knew how they'd react and they'd be joyful at the demise. All right. Uh, the people of God would be happy and they would spread the news of the coming destruction. So they didn't want to tell them. The house of Afra means a house of dust. So it's kind of, you know, rolling in the dust is a sign of extreme mourning. And they're rolling in the dust in the house of dust. So it's a play on words, but that was also an actual location. Verse 11, pass on you who dwell in Safir, nakedness and shame. She who dwells in Zahanan will not come out. Wailing of Beit Azel, he will take from you its standing place. Now, Zahanan means going out, and it's saying they will not go out. So, again, it's another play on words, something that's very popular in Hebrew scriptures. I wish we understood a lot of it and get more out of it, but there are many things like that in the original language that we don't pick up in English. But they would not go out to console their neighbors who had been overrun. Safir means fair city and it's going to pass away naked. So that's an embarrassing embarrassment that this fair city is going to be destroyed. Okay, Beit Hetzel is means the house at one's side. And 
and speaking of the shame coming upon these cities as well, and the house on one side is not going to be at your side. That's the implication there. Because urging everyone to mourn and repent, he wants them to join him in his mourning and turning away from the wicked ways. Verses 12 and 13. For she who dwells in Marot has languished for something good. For calamity has come down from Adonai to Jerusalem's gate. Harness the chariot to the steed, O inhabitant of Lachish. It was the beginning of sin for the daughter of Zion, because in you were found the rebellions of Israel. Marot, which uh, the mother of Jesus, has a, it's Mara, it's the root word there, and it means bitterness. And I think we probably have fewer people named Mary in this day if we understood the meaning of the name. We also have fewer Jameses, Jims, which comes from Jacob, Yaakov, which means deceiver, supplanter, a lot of, a lot of not so pleasant things. <laughs> Don't trust any Jims that you need and can't be trusted. That actually goes for everybody else. There's only one person we trust. And we capitalize his name. <laughs> All righty. For she who dwells in the world has languished for something good. She's bitter because she has not received something good. And the people expected God to protect them. But because they did not repent, he did not protect them. And great sorrow and bitterness came to them. All right. Lachish was located in south southwest of Jerusalem. So this is getting close to home. And Yal Lachish was a key military fortress. And their sin was dependence on military might. It was a well-protected, outlying fortification of Jerusalem. Sadakarib of Assyria spoiled that city. He took Lachish. Basically wiped it out. So in this, he's telling them to harness up their best horses and flee to safety in their chariots because they're not going to protect them. And it appears from this that Lachish was involved in the same transgressions as Israel. So this was an outlying military town that was gone to the dark side, so to speak. And it also appears that that was happening in Yerushalayim itself. Verses 14 and 15. Therefore, you will give parting gifts to Morashet God, houses of Akzib, as a deception to the kings of Israel. Yet I will bring the possessor to you, inhabitant of Morashah. The glory of Israel will come as far as Adilam. All right, parting gifts reference here is actually a marriage, a bridal reference. And they are a symbol of the parting of the bride. And these gifts refer to what a shape got going into captivity. She is leaving. That city is gone. Yudah is involved in the very same sins as these Bibles. And the party gift means that Yudah has given up that city. The city is given to the enemy, and it's the glory of Israel as a reference to the leading citizens and the nobility of Israel who have been fleeing continuously from Israel before the Assyrian invasion. And the Agilab is a reference to the cave that David hid in. So they are fleeing to that case, <coughs> but it will do them no good at the bottom line there. Oh boy, I think I've made it to the last sheet, which I didn't pick up. All right, and the last verse, 16. That was my time. Yeah. That'll work. Shave yourself bald. Yes, shear your hair for the children of your delight. 
Now, if you read that in English, does it make any sense at all to you? Cut off your hair for your the children you delight in. This is where I find the diving into the words, which may or may not be exciting for you, probably not. But the getting the meaning out of what it meant to them that day is critical, particularly for the Hebrew Scriptures. But that particular phrase hit me as a, that's just weird. And it gets weirder. In larger bald spot like a vulture. For they went from you into exile. Alright, priests were forbid, absolutely forbidden to shave their heads during this time. And the people, likewise, were not to imitate this, which was seen as a heathen practice. However, it was acceptable as a sign of deep mourning. Sort of like ripping your clothes off. Shaving your head was a sign of, of major mourning. So that's what he's telling to do here. And baldness is sort of a double entendre. It refers to the mourning, but it is also it also references and speaks to adultery. And we've seen that theme throughout this. An unfaithful wife had her head shaved so the world would know that she was a little adult and adulterous. And Mikhail is telling the people to mourn for those who have been taken from them. Because they have lost prisoners at, during his time with the Assyrians. Alright, this was sort of an exposition of some of the scripture. And like I said, it often sounds strange if we're just reading through it real quickly. But there's always a deep meaning to go for there. And he was witnessing among all the people of his day what God intended to do to correct the situation. And it wasn't pretty. So why don't we study this? What's in it for us? I'm sure you've heard the expression or something like it, that uh, those who do not learn from history are doomed to repeat it. Anybody not heard that expression? No. It's really good. Now, there is some truth to that. I mean, I agree with the premise. But it seems like sometimes, maybe even often, even if we do learn from our past mistakes, we often repeat them anyway. And that's what Israel is doing throughout their history. They'll go to God. They'll find something else more interesting culturally. They'll pursue that. They'll suffer for it. They'll go back to God. They'll go through a time that they're close and then wander away. And we see that over and over again in Israel. And where I came down with this study is seeing it. I'm old enough that I've had I got to repeat some of the same mistakes multiple times. Anybody can't identify with that, someday you will, I'm certain. So how many of us are frustrated by some sin we just can't seem to get away from, despite knowing how much damage it's caused us in the past, and recognizing this cause going to cause pain and hurt in the future? I'm not asking you to raise your hand, sir. <laughs> so think about it. If you can't think of that, God bless you. If you're learning from your past mistakes, you're doing better than I am. And often preachers are going to stand up and tell us you know, what we need to do to apply the lesson tonight to our lives, and that's the purpose of studying the Bible. And I'm not going to disagree with that, but I'm not a preacher. I'm not that much of a teacher. So I'm not going to be presumptuous and tell you anything that you need to take out of here tonight. What I want you to do is take anything that God's put on your heart to Him. And if you are totally blank in that, I'm going to give you a few questions here. And I'm actually 
happy we're almost out of time. If you want to hang around and talk them over with others, that's fine. But I really see these as something to take to God, talk to Him about, ask Him for and ask Him to meet you in a quiet place sometime tonight, tomorrow, next week. Put this in your pocket and it shows up in six months. That was probably the right time for you to talk about it. Those questions are, in this story, who would you have been and how would your life have played out in this ancient time? You've got a good imagination and you can see yourself at this time. Are you a big cop? Are you an evil king? Are you just one of the unlucky ones that gets hauled off that have no power and no say? But where would you be in this story? Where do you see yourself? I might tell you something about how you're seeing yourself now. Now, in what ways is your life a similar struggle between God and the culture? And then that I'm looking at, how often do you slide back into the things you know that God isn't thrilled with? And you know you're forgiven, and you know you're His forever, but it's still a temptation to do those things that we, we don't want to do. Uh, one of the nice discussions we had recently with one of our other assisting pastors was about unrepentant sin. And we ended up pretty close to the same page. But if you can look at your sin and honestly say to God, God, if this could be taken from me by you today, then I would be overjoyed with that. It's not saying He will do it. It's just saying you would want that to happen. If you can't say that about a sin, that's one that's controlling your life. That's one that's going to bring you to a place of judgment. Say, no, I really like doing this, and I don't want to take that away, even though I know it's wrong. That's an issue. So look at it in, in that respect. Because the people were just following the culture, and they were doing what they wanted to do, even knowing that this was displeasing God. Does that mean we're lost? No. You have come to that point of salvation. God's not going to take it from you because of something you did. He didn't give it to you because of something you did other than ex accept what He did. But it will bring you to the point of having confrontation with God. And does anybody know who wins those every time? Mm -hmm. When we're at that place, ask God, you know, God, if I can miraculously get this out of my life, I want that. Will He do it for you? Maybe. Will you ever be outside of that temptation? Maybe, maybe not. But that doesn't define your relationship with Him. And if you get into that place of saying, well, I've screwed up so bad, God doesn't want anything to do with me while I'm there. You are surrendering to the enemy. Because God's never going to tell you that. And he's never going to do that. <laughs> so that sort of brings us to the last question. You know, what are you doing about those places? And maybe nothing. And maybe that's the right answer. But we have to be aware of the sin that taking root in our life and controlling us and keeping us from being all we can be. And then we take that to God. But He's the only one that has the answers, I know. So take these questions to Him. And we will see you again next week. And I haven't read ahead to two. I'm hoping it's a little more fun than one, but I doubt it will be. <laughs>
The guy has always been one of my favorite prophets, not because I knew that much about him, because most of my reading is New Testament. I'm trying to get over that this year again. I'm trying to get over it in the past, but that's one of those things I circle back to. But I am reading all the Bible this year. But that's not the same. Look at me. I'm a great example. I'm not. I'm a terrible reader. And most of my Bible experiences when I got nothing else to do. <laughs> and that's almost never. But the real issue there is the relationship and Bible study is a good way to build a relationship. So it's a thing to do. However, I forgot where I was going with this. But anyway, anyway the, the bottom line to all this is, you know, take these things to God. Don't expect uh, any person to give you the answers. God may give you the answer through them. That happens. But the answers that you need always come from Him. And I love that you guys are here, and this is a good place to get in touch with Him to hear those things. So is sitting at home alone and reading your Bible reading a, a good, biblically-based book. God's going to meet you wherever you are if you're seeking Him. And if it's reading a comic book about Jesus, that's okay. There's, there's no place that He won't meet you if you're seeking Him. So do that. Do that with what you read and Oh, I know where I was going, and I got sidetracked. He was. This is my favorite minor prophet because of one verse that I made my life first for a lot of years. It's not anymore, but he has shown me, oh man, what is good. And read six eight if you read nothing else in this, and that's five weeks from now. So show up for that. Let's pray. Loving Father, we thank you for this time together. Opportunity to be in a holy place. And it's not the building. It's recognizing your presence. You're always with us. But it doesn't really become special until we are recognizing turning to you and the things that we need and the things that we don't know are missing. We don't hear most of the answers that we're looking for until we've asked you what we need to be asking. So Lord, I thank you for this opportunity to be here tonight for these men and their pursuit of you. Lord, may it always be about that and not anything that the culture or the world has to offer. We pray this in the name of Yeshua HaMashiach. Amen.